Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Nick Davenport, aka Mr. Mental Muscle, and we're here today on the Mental Muscle Podcast. Now, I have a special guest today, Michael Sartain. I came across his page talking with another psychologist named Dr. David Buss, but when I explored more and more about him, I saw some things that we could definitely collaborate on as far as it applies to performance, life, just anything that can go. So with that being said, I'll let you give a little input on your life, how you got to this point, and we can get into the topics. Man, it's just so many ways for me to, to go about this because I get this question all the time. So I used to be, you know, I'm a retired U.S. military officer. Um, I was, um, you know, living in Texas during 9-11, and then I joined the Air Force back in 04. I was in there for uh, seven years, and I really learned a lot about so some 04 to 11. I learned about what good leadership looks like and what bad leadership looks like. And that was like a really, really important understanding for me. And then what happened was when I got out, um, I started looking at, uh, I, I got involved in like the male self-improvement space. And some of it was just straight up, you know, everything from Tony Robbins. Uh, a lot of guys did this, you know, now Grant Cardone, guys like that. But then I also saw like some of the dating spaces. And what I saw was they were sort of missing some of the ideology from the military. So like, I, I feel like a lot of those guys in the dating space should read things like Jocko Willick or read things like David Goggins to understand ideas like obsession and determination and accountability, which I didn't really see a lot in the dating space. And then I stumbled in 2011 or 2012, I was living in Los Angeles and my buddy Owen Cook, the guy who runs RSD invited me to a party over at uh, Ty Lopez's house. So I, I met Ty Lopez for the first time and Ty told me about a professor. He had actually made a couple of videos about a professor named Dr. David Buss. I found out that Dr. Dr. Buss was actually a longhorn, just like me from UT Austin. And I became obsessed with his books and then all the other books that are in that field. So Stephen Sto Stephen Stewart Williams, Jeffrey Wilson, uh, also uh, Cindy Meston, Satoshi Kanazawa, and David Allen. There are also these people who cover this idea called evolutionary psychology. Now, as the first half of the 19th century, I think a lot of people would agree the most important uh, discoveries would be you know, relativity, quantum mechanics, and then maybe like the advent of antibiotics at the end of the, the first half, and also flight, winged flight, probably 1908. And the second half of the 20th century, you know, you, there's space travel, things like that. To me, from a, psycho from a science standpoint, one of the most underrated discoveries of the second half of the 1900s of the 20th century was the concept that we could take the concepts from Darwin's uh, natural selection uh, on the origin of species, Darwin's concept of, uh, of how natural selection worked, and then apply that to the human mind, to human psychology. For the longest time, what psychologists believed was that everything below the neck was a product of evolution, and everything above the neck was a product of God or higher intellect or whatever, instead of asking the question, why is it that homo sapiens have higher intellect? And then here's the other thing, Nicholas, like, here, I'll give you a really basic question that a lot of people don't ask themselves. How many, do you know how many other hominids there were on this planet? Like we found, uh, uh, archaeologists have found, or and anthropologists have found fossil records of other forms of hominids, just to let you guys know, you're not the only humans that have ever lived on this planet. You're the only homo sapiens, however. Uh, there was also homo habilis, homo australis, homo neanderthalis. How many previous versions of hominid were there before us? Do you remember? I'm not sure. Maybe at least four or five, because I know Austria. It's, it's somewhere between 15 and... Yeah, somewhere between 15 and 20. Oh. Over the last 3 million years, wow. there were 15 to 20 other forms of hominids. So now here's the next question you got to ask yourself. What happened to them, Nicholas? <laughs> what happened to them? So I'm the looking answer is somewhat. I'm we sorry. answer is we ate them and we raped them. That's what happened. We yeah, literally basically. killed them. We are the most violent species that has ever existed on this planet. And this is where, Nicholas, this is where a lot of people diverge and they don't want to be a part of this discussion anymore because they want to believe that Homo sapiens were always this peaceful community. If you know, now we don't have a written record of what happened during hunter gatherer times, but we, we, we can imagine it was probably a brutal existence with some level of violence. But we do know that mankind throughout history, if you, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, watch All Quiet on the Western Front. Like read books yeah, about it. how war was actually fought. Uh, learn about what Pol Pot did to the, you know, the Khmer Rouge in, in uh, Cambodia. Learn about the, the, the wheat famines under Mao Zedong in China. 100 million people dying. The 25 million Russians that died during World War II. Uh, the, like, you'll find that the, we have, or the barbarians, the barbarians storming uh, Rome. Like, uh, like, when you go back and you look at some of these things, the incredible level of violence and chaos that humans are capable of, of uh that, that's one of these things that uh, it just makes it really, when you come to that understanding, we, you need to start from that. That is the basis that you have to start with, hairless murder apes. 
And then when you move away from that basis, again, you guys watch Joe Rogan experience. What is it? It's a monkey. That's the reason why he does that because Joe Rogan understands natural selection. And so when you look at humans from that standpoint and then realize that we we grew through cultural evolution to do things like, hey, I'm going to pay with my credit card. Think about this. I'm going to give you a credit card and you're going to just trust that there's money on the credit card. You can't see the money. And, the, and I'm going to trust that there's money on the credit card. And then I'm going to trust you to give me my $15 Frappuccino that it's not poisoned because you're not trying to take my land or my wife. I'm going to trust in this system where I give you this money, this imaginary money, and then you give me a Frappuccino and we've built this system of trust with you know this man uh, creating a, a, a compact with other man, which creates civilization. Civilization is the later adaptation, but there are earlier adaptations from evolutionary psychology, which causes people to, like for instance, jealousy being an evolutionary adaptation, mate guarding being an evolutionary adaptation, men being more uh, interested in casual sex than women are as an evolutionary adaptation, women being more interested in men who are taller than them as an adaptation, women being more interested in men who are older than, than them is an evolutionary adaptation and men being interested in women who have signs of facial symmetry, a 0.72 hip to waist ratio, and women being interested in men who have a 0 0.6, 0 0.165 to one shoulder to width ratio. These are things that we can measure through evolutionary psychology studies. And then we can determine, we can look back and say, okay, what was it that our ancestors we're looking for to want individuals to look this way or to have these attributes. And then we can look in the future and say, we can actually predict why is this person going to do what they're going to do? Like, for instance, if, if you believe that humans are, again, are all hairless murder apes and we're all only interested in higher sexual selection and higher status, then what Vladimir Putin did invading Ukraine actually makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? It actually makes a little bit more sense. You know, when you think about Steve Jobs creating Apple, and then he just starts dating a bunch of supermodels. Like it kind of makes a little bit more sense, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, like you start looking at these things from an evolutionary psychology standpoint that we are simply like meat robots that are that are programmed. But again, that's not very noble. And by the way, I do believe in God. I just think that's a that's a different plane. That's mm -hmm. a, and that's a different discussion. But in this in this category, when we have this discussion, then things make more sense. And no disrespect to to Sigmund Freud, but Sigmund Freud made his assertions. By while about you know uh, young boys wanting to have sex with their mothers, et cetera. He made those assertions while high on cocaine, having an interview with one 12 year old boy. Like it, it just like that wasn't scientific. Psychology was a soft science back then. Today yep. it's a hard science. We can actually do test, we can look at testable models and we can actually understand why do humans behave the way they do. Or at least we can determine that humans behave in a certain way over others. And we can suss out what is cultural. Oh, or I mean, what is environmental and what is genetic? We can do that now. Like for instance, uh, the fact that men like signs of youth and women, we know now indefatigably it's genetics. We know that now it's not a function. Like you and I don't aren't attracted to attractive women because of the fact that we saw them on magazines and we don't like sugar, salt, and watch the McDonald's commercial. It's the other way around. We were born liking sugar, salt, and fat because that's what our ancestors liked. And we were born finding women who are look physically attractive. You know, think of what, whatever, Mar Margot Robbie, Selma Hayek when she was super young, whatever, Mariah Carey when she was wrong, Jessica Biel, name Vivica Fox, whoever. Yeah, you can go on. Um, we, we, you keep going on. But, but the thing is, you and I are, I, I'll bet you, Nicholas, if you and I went down a list and we had a hundred other men with us about which women we, we found attractive, we would probably agree to like a 96 percentile we would agree mm -hmm. we might that'd be a few men in there it's like that don't like asian women or african-american women or whatever or white women or whatever but for the most part we're gonna find women even if you don't like white women margot robbie's still fucking attractive you know what i'm saying so as men we find we tend to find the same things attractive why is that well there must be an evolutionary reason for that for us to all find the same things attractive and then the people who don't believe that are people like you know oh what's it called uh Victoria's Secret, where they put different body types. I'm all for inclusivity. Body That's totally fine. Body positivity movement. Body positivity. But the thing is, with the body positivity movement, while you can make it easier for them to feel good about themselves, you can't make me attracted to them. And that's that's where you lose me. You you can't make me attracted to them. That's what the issue is. But isn't and that kind of setting them up for failure, kind of? Because you look at, say, when women go to clubs... Who's getting let, let left outside? It's usually the, yeah. the bigger girl. So you're saying, hey, yeah. I'm just as beautiful as this size three woman, but then I'm not getting into the club. So now you set them up for that. Yeah, I've that seen failure. I've seen that. And then and then they, what they do is they project their hatred onto the bouncer and then they start, they they it becomes a political thing. And the thing is like, no, it's not the case. Like we run a business and men tend to buy more bottles because they want to look higher status when they're around more attractive women and you don't meet that 
criteria. I'm like, no, but I looked on Victoria's Secret and they said that I'm attractive. And I'm like, Victoria's Secret can say whatever they want, but like the bouncer is not going to like quote evolutionary psychology, but the bouncer <laughs> is a product of evolutionary psychology. He's a gatekeeper for like lower status to higher status. You're trying to get into the club and then you get into the club. And that, by the way, it's not just for physically attractive women. You can make the same statement for like lower status men. Men, we're not judged so much on our physical attractiveness, but we still are judged um, on, on other things most likely competency. I had a girl ask me last night, it was like, where does money fit in the ancestral period? And like money today is an analogy for competency. Competency is what women found attractive. The best fisherman, the best hunter, the best builder, the best provider, the best protector. That was a sign of competency. Money is an analogy, a 2023 analogy in uh, modern times for, uh, for for competency, which women find attractive. And so that's the reason why extreme levels of competency can overcome men with, who are physically unattractive or short or overweight, or even have a terrible personality. We've all seen the super rich guy with the hot girl. That's an example of where competency outweighs that. So there must be an answer somewhere in our evolutionary past to explain why that is. And that's what it is. Like when a woman probably 50,000 years ago, she had a choice between which mate to choose. She's going to choose a competent mate. For some of us, we'll look and see a woman and she'll pick the guy with the broadest shoulders and the biggest arms. And it's like, oh, that makes sense. Her and her offspring, she's going to have strong children. Her and her offspring are going to be protected by a big, strong father who, can, who has a big rock to swing or a big club or a big spear. And he's willing to do violence on behalf of me, the woman, me and my offspring. If he's willing to do that violence, I know I have a higher percentage chance of survival, and that's why I'll choose them. And then you'll see women will end up cheating on their husbands with a six foot three bartender with tattoo sleeves. That's the reason why that'll happen. But additionally, you see women find Leonardo DiCaprio attractive, and he's like five seven, five eight, something like that. Why do they find him attractive? Because he's a fantastic actor and he's extremely wealthy. So he shows competency through his acting. He also shows incredibly high social alignments and social acuity. And number three, he's richer than fucking fuck. And those things. When you put them all together, that's the reason why you can explain why a short guy is attractive to some women and a tall, good-looking guy is attractive to others. You made a good point using the analogy as money is the sign for competence. And I actually have a, an associate of mine. He's actually an ex-seal, and we're talking about something similar. And I said a term, I called it financial masculinity. Like like you said, someone who's 5'5", five, five, chubby, 2,000 years ago would not have been the ideal candidate he would have been either killed or his wife would have been taken from him, whatever it may be. But now you got guys like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos who For sure. aren't the, the product of a, a masculine man, maybe on paper, but they're billionaires. They could buy the world, you know, and but, that's but making up. For it. But, consider, but consider this, right? Bill Gates to women would be rich. Jeff Bezos would be rich. They would not conceptualize $300 billion versus $400 billion. Those concepts don't mean anything. When I talk to women who are dating men who are rich, they just know that they're rich. They say words like billionaires. Most of the guys that they that are dating that they think are billionaires are not billionaires. They, they happen to work for a company that's worth a billion dollars, but they're not billionaires. What's happened is that 5'5 five, five guy that you talked about during the ancestral period, There's that's really interesting. There's this Polynesian culture where they're whalers, right? Nicholas, let me ask you something. You stand on the front of a boat and you throw spears into whales. Is it actually better to be taller or shorter in order to do that? Well, if it's close range, I think someone with shorter arms would be more precise. But if it's further, it's not, you want it's a not even arm. it's not even shorter arms. It's like better balance. You can stand uh, on the front of the boat without right. Do you understand what I'm saying? And be, okay, being able yeah. to have better balance on the front of the boat mm -hmm. so that you can throw better that stability. Spears. Yeah. In in that society, shorter men who are are it's not that they're valued more because they're short. They're valued more because they're competent. Some men are actually better hunters by being smaller individuals. In the United States, we have that. You know what it's called? fighter pilots and rat race car drivers. Those tend to be smaller individuals. Also horse jockeys would mm -hmm. be another example where you can be small and competent. How about middleweight or lightweight boxers? You see that as well too. These guys are incredibly attractive to women, but they're at, they fight at like a 145 pound weight class. So there are ways of being competent and being smaller. So the thing that's most important is competency. But if you don't have competency, the way you make up for that is you look like David Beckham. David Beckham doesn't need to be competent. He, although he is a fantastic soccer player, right? Or he was. Um, he th so that that's the thing as far as male to female attraction is concerned. Uh, it's the level of competency. So the way Dr. Buss would these are my words, by the way, because I have a coaching program. Dr. Buss would say it in a way like this. He'd say the ability to uh, uh, to acquire resources. So we so I'm saying competency, but like that's what that's what competency is when you think yeah. about it, right? It's the ability to re acquire resources. So for instance, what would women rather date? A guy who actually owns 
a company that um, that actually does waste management. He owns a bunch of garbage trucks that he he rents out to the city. Okay, or a second guy who's an associate at a law firm. The associate at the law firm actually law works firm. more hours and makes less money. But women are going to see the status mm -hmm. in his job and be like, oh, he's going to be richer. Yep. Is he going to be a famous lawyer? Now, a lot of times this is wrong. Obviously, a lot of self, like a lot of guys who have those really boring businesses, like, you know, uh, laundry mats or they own shitty apartment complexes or the guys that own like, you know, trucking companies or rental agencies, those guys are actually become very wealthy. Uh, but the thing is, they don't really have sexy jobs. But women are always trying to suss out which one of these individuals. Often, you'll see people who are residents, uh, like their their uh, the residencies for for medical school, or, or they're working as residencies as doctors. Women will often try to date those guys. This is something very often happened when I was on a U.S. military base. Women would go after the first and second lieutenants because they knew that these guys were eventually going to get you know, become majors and captains, and they're going to have like a steady income for a long period of time that puts them in the upper middle class as far as income is concerned. You can make a lot of money on flight pay if you're a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force. So so those those type of things is what women will for. The ability to acquire resources uh, would be would be something that they, that they would look for. And so that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, women look for those cues and men look for different cues. We don't generally, when it comes to dating, when we see a woman who has money, that's her money. My money is yeah. our money. Her, her money is her money. Yeah, That's generally that what we do. She might buy you dinner every once in a while or buy you a gift, but generally it's not women. Uh, like in throughout my lifetime, mo myself nor any man that I know is not really taken care of mostly by women. Yeah, that's interesting because all this coming back, it's also it's always challenged nowadays because it's 2023. And I always would argue that we're in a science experiment that's just starting, but it's like that hasn't been sustained over a long period of time. We only last, what, 40, 50 years we've lived in this new modern era of women can work now, obviously. They can make their own money. They can lead and do yep. certain things. But that hasn't been sustained for all. It's literally been in our lifespan, really. I'm not sure how old you are. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm 34, about to be 35. Yeah. So my parents are like the first generation of people who lived in a world where there's uh, what's called birth control. There's uh, women's yep. rights change, civil rights with Black people. So it's like we're in a whole new yep. era that has not been sustained, but we're making these choices long term, like from an evolutionary psychology standpoint, yeah. like it may not work 20 years from now, how we're acting in the dating market or life in general. You know, what, what I'll tell you a, a weird analogy. Um, I think the civil rights movement has done nothing but help the economy because it's allowed people who normally would have been disenfranchised from being at the top of the workforce. Uh, the, the workforce is important as a total, but the people at the top, the greatest innovators, they can be any ethnicity. The per person who cures cancer doesn't matter what his ethnicity is, right? And so some of that wasn't being allowed pre-1964, 1965. Those, so those things are incredible. The thing that, so there, there aren't a lot of, to me, I don't think there's a ton of negatives to being more inclusive from a racial standpoint in society. And of course, from an egalitarian standpoint, it's the only moral thing you can do. But for the standpoint of like, say, Title IX in 1972 or 74, I forgot what yeah. year it was. The thing with that is, while it's also terrific for women to receive rights, like, again, women certainly were being discriminated against at that time, there were consequences to that. And some of those consequences are now 68% of college graduates in some areas are female. 5% of, of psychologists under the age of 30 are male. There are more female military pilots than there are male kindergarten teachers as a percentage. It's, it's pretty maddening like how things have changed because what's happened is we had a workforce, a male workforce, and regardless of what you think about gender politics, men tend, tend to, not always, tend to gravitate towards male-dominated fields, and women tend to gravitate towards female-dominated fields. That's why they're female-dominated fields. Women tend to tend to gravitate more towards education and dealing with people and, and healthcare. Men tend to gravitate more towards engineering or fighting in the US military or taking jobs like that. When you look at those jobs on balance, you'll find that the jobs that men take tend to pay more than the jobs that women take. And that's where some of the page gap, the pay wage gap comes from is from the choices that we as men and women make. What happened after Title IX though, and what happened after we started changing some of the, the, the socioeconomic truths is that women caught up, which is great. We wanted women to catch up, but men fell behind. Because as we started getting women to become lawyers, doctors, and accountants, we did not get men to start becoming nurses. 
and, and school teachers. It didn't go in the opposite direction. And so what you had was this large number of men who were educated and brought up in a, in a way to believe that they should be coal miners or join the military or whatever, whatever masculine job is out there, whatever manufacturing job is pro probably maybe working at a car plant or something like that. The global economic marketplace started sending those manufacturing jobs somewhere else and alternative forms of energy started getting rid of some of those petroleum jobs, some of those jobs in coal mining, some of those other manufacturing jobs and engineering jobs. And what happened is you had started having a large group of men that were disenfranchised economically. And then because of women, because of birth control and also, you know, women having other rights. One of the things we never talk about, Nicholas, and I, and I, it's really interesting to me is how little we discuss the fact that women are good now at firing guns. Like I, we yeah. don't talk about this as much, but it really does change a dynamic because I don't care how tough you are. A woman who knows how to use a pit viper or a Glock, a fucking 2011 or a Glock, that is going to be a tough woman to try to, to do anything to in, in one essence, you know, in, a, in a, from approximate standpoint, not from an ultimate standpoint, but from approximate standpoint, a woman who makes $200,000 a year and owns a firearm doesn't need a man. She genuinely does not. Now, from an ultimate standpoint, we all need men. Right, obviously, because men built the building that I'm in and telecommunications yeah. and the infrastructure of the community from an ultimate standpoint, from a proximate standpoint, not necessarily do, do, do women need men. But now that the question is now because they don't need men, do they want men? And then when they find those men, those men remember 68% of college graduates are female. So now those men don't have college graduate, don't have college degrees. And now these men become unsatisfactory to these women now who are making more money, who own a firearm. I'm just using that as one example. There's several other examples. But that like there's several where women can just hire a handyman, whatever. Women don't need to be in a relationship with a competent man. A better way to say this is not that women don't need men. It's just in a relationship. If this was 1850 and you're a woman out on a farm, you're far better off to have a competent, you know, man and son, your know, husband and sons to protect you in the farm. Whereas today, a woman doesn't need that anymore. So what that's done is it's changed society for better or for worse, but let's just at least admit that's what's going on. So economically, men have fallen behind. Educationally, men have fallen behind. And in the dating pool, 80% of men on dating apps are deemed to be unattractive. 63% of the right swipes go to the top 10% of men on dating apps. Uh, uh, Scott Galloway, well, you guys should look up Scott Galloway. He's got tremendous videos. Just look up some of his clips. Scott Galloway. Where he talks about if dating were, if dating were a country, it would be the most unegalitarian country in the world. The, the greatest amount of wealth disparity there is. And I will tell you personally, as someone who's like gotten in shape, gotten in the gym, started an eight, you know, an eight figure business, the, the amount of attention I get from women is more. And it's not because I'm better. I, I'm not, I'm not some kind of suave pimp. That's not why, yeah. but it's because women externally can see that I have my shit together and that I get it because of that. I've noticed I don't really have to try as hard to attract women now at this point in my life as I did when I was 23 and women just assume that I was inexperienced and broke. And I think most women would agree with that. That's those were some of the things that they find to be attractive. So when you when you see that situation, you start to understand that like you have this large group of men who are fallen behind in the dating market. They've fallen behind with the family. They've fallen behind educationally, um, and 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 they've fallen behind economically. And so there is a consequence to what we've done in the sexual dating market politically with things like Title IX to where there's a bunch of women who are not satisfied with the men that they can get and a bunch of men who are not having any success with women at all, about something around 33% of men under the age of 30 have zero sexual partners. And that number is going to grow massively. Something like, it's the number's two to one. It's twice as many men, something in the mid 60s, twice as many men as women under the age of 30 are single. Well, why is that? Why? How could you have half as many women single as men under the age of 30? Well, the answer, the answer is pretty obvious. It's because those women are dating older men Same. who are more established, right? And then and then the other one that I, you know, I thought was really interesting, uh, Pat DeBed David did this study. And you can actually look at the human genome and see this throughout history. What is the variance on the different types of Y chromosomes and X chromosomes that you see throughout populations? And from that, you can actually tell what percentage of men populated versus women populated throughout history. And it's about 40% of men and 80% of women. That also tells you this concept of surplus men has been with us throughout history, where there's a few men who have far more uh, options when it comes to, to money and women and, a, and, and status, and a great number of men who have very little. 
And so because of that, like again, 60% of men never procreated. I think the number is actually lower. I think it's probably closer to 25. If you count infant mortality, I think that number is closer to 25. Before the year 1850, one half of the earth's population died before the age of five. So when you consider that, if you consider all those men too, I think that number is probably closer to 25% of men throughout history wow. has, have ever po- have procreated. So now I mean, when you come to that realization, bro, it, it just really, oh, sorry, man. One of my rescues, I rescue animals. One of my rescues. Yeah, I heard about that on here. one of your shows. So, you know, the thing is, what, what's different, Nicholas, is that you understand I'm not prescribing anything and I'm not one of these like black pill doomers, red pill, mm-hmm. I hate women, three, fuck those 304s. Type of, <laughs> yeah. I don't do any of that. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm interested in, from a socioeconomic standpoint, how do we help to try to solve this problem? Because these men still do matter, right? It's just the thing is, when, when it comes to identity politics, like poor men, who stands up for them? Kind of nobody, you know what I'm anyone. saying? Not really anyone. So, so what happens is those poor men just kind of get left behind. And so when you look at homeless people, you're far more likely to be a man than a woman to be homeless. You're far more likely to suffer mental illness. You're far more likely to commit suicide. You're far more likely to die in a military accident, uh, to, far more likely to get assaulted, far more likely to get murdered, far more likely to die in some sort of like industrial accident if you're a man versus a woman. And so because of that, like, again, again, I'm not bl- I'm not saying as a man, I'm a victim. I love being a man. I would, wouldn't choose anything else. Uh, but but when you come to that realization, you're like, how do we sort of swing things back to where things are back more moderate, uh, to where men and women both don't feel disenfranchised. And I think we've gotten things out of whack. Uh, Again, the argument, Nicholas, I actually like, uh, I don't love it. I'd say maybe like a four out of 10. I love NBA basketball, 10 out of 10. And I, because I love basketball so much, I, whenever I watch like really good women play basketball, it's actually interesting to me. Like I liked watching was that like one girl for Iowa who was like hitting all those threes. Uh, I, I forgot what her name is. Something Clark. Something Clark. Yeah, something Clark. Name. That was really interesting to watch. I really enjoyed watching her play. Right. I watched Candace Parker. She plays here for the. She just got signed with uh, the the basketball team here, and I I enjoy watching really good women play. But it's like four out of ten. It's not like ten out of ten. The thing is the idea that w- the female basketball players should make as much as the men. You simply don't understand economics. It's, it's, they're yeah, not business. as good as the men. <laughs> yeah, just don't understand business. You, like it, They're just not as good as the men. And the WNBA loses money every year, and it's completely subsidized by the men. And it's really yeah. funny because it was Draymond Green of all people. Draymond Green, who is very politically progressive. It was Draymond Green who called out Lisa Leslie I on that show. That. Um, that, yeah, and, and it basically said, hey, listen, we, we, fund, like, we support you more than anyone. You can complain to whoever you want. Don't complain to the NBA. You exist because of the NBA, and NBA players are at front row seats of WNBA games all the time because ball is ball. Really good basketball players, male or female, are fun to watch because basketball is the most beautiful sport I've ever seen. But when you see that and you come to that concept, the idea that they don't make as much money is like you don't understand the economics. Female tennis players, why do they make so much money? Because it's fucking entertaining. Mm-hmm. Female tennis is actually kind of fun to watch. You know what I'm saying? You know what else is fun to watch? Female MMA is actually kind of cool. Like I don't hate watching yeah. Ronda Rousey. That was kind of fun watching her go on a run. Why? So so because of that, does she make more money? She actually makes more money than a lot yeah. of the male counterparts. She said it on an why? interview. Because she of, talked about that. Yeah, because of supply and demand. So don't say it's just because they're women. It's not just because they're women. Again, it, it's because like uh, Tennessee balls basketball in Tennessee, that, that shit sells out because those, those girls are really good at playing basketball. The thing is, it's a function of supply and demand. So there's certain things that women can do better than men and certain things that men can do better than women. This idea, but the, 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 the point is, Nicholas, the fact that we're even having that discussion shows that we're not sitting in reality. The idea that women basketball players should be paid anywhere near what male basketball players are being paid, it tells you we're not living in reality. You see what I'm saying? Actually, like that, it really shouldn't be. It, yeah, oh, it shouldn't sorry. be a discussion. It really should not be a discussion, because because the thing is, like, they don't perform. If you wanted to say female firefighters should be paid more, I don't have a problem with that because they perform a service that's necessary for society. Playing basketball is ancillary for men and women, and so this idea that they should get paid more is just like there's no real moral argument for this. You know, you understand what I'm saying? So that that's kind of what that's the way I look at it. I, I looked into this one time the. I looked up just randomly Brittany Griner since she was trending a few months ago when she got sent back to America. So I think she had like 800,000 followers on IG. All the Kardashian yeah. sisters have like over 300 million. Some have more yeah. than U.S. population. So that right there answers the question. These women who, hey, grant their success, great. But that's where the, the female viewership is really going. Mostly men watch the WNBA or buy tickets yeah. to the WNBA. So 
like you said, it's not really a male versus female thing. It's like a supply and demand. If I give money to this business, then we're going to go under. Because I think they've yeah. done under like, I think, old like 10 million in the red every it's, single it's year. It's about two, 10 million red every year. But the thing is, like, when people make that argument, then you ask them to name four WNBA teams, <laughs> they can't. Crickets. I know who, I know. The, the reason why I, I can speak on this is because I know who Lisa Leslie and Rebecca Lobo are. I know who Sue Bird are. I love mm -hmm. basketball more than anything. I'm a basketball junkie. So when they make this argument towards me, I'm not uneducated when it comes to the WNBA. I just know it's not as good. I, a lot of people are just like, yeah, the product sucks. I'll tell you, the product doesn't suck. It's just not as Cynthia Cooper is a good, if Cynthia Cooper, Cooper could kick the shit out of you and me, but she can't kick the shit out of LeBron. That's the difference. And so because of that, we get to choose, do we want to see a better form of basketball or a lesser form of basketball? Tickets to the NBA games are still more expensive than tickets to college basketball games. And that's a re there's a reason why it's because that skill set is unique. Tom Brady or whoever, you know, uh, what's his face? I, I, I think Lamar Jackson just got a $50 million a year yeah. contract. I believe he agreed to that. He doesn't get that contract because of some unegalitarian nature that a patriarchy created to just pay men more. He got that contract because there aren't a lot of six foot two guys who can run a four, three and throw the football 75 yards. That's why he got that contract. And so because he's a scarce commodity, there are very few, like, like the guy can, he can sling it. Right, he can spin that football. So questions on accuracy and questions on like maybe decision making. That dude's insanely fast and he's insanely talented. And the Houston Texans should have given up all their draft picks to get Lamar Jackson. Um, that was silly for them to not do that. But yeah, um, but the thing is, the point is, you get that money. You don't get that money because you're a man. You get that money because you're scarce, right? And this is another issue that goes with the male female dynamic that's confusing. We do. You, have you ever done the female delusional calculator and the male delusional calculator? Have you ever tried I, that? Actually. Did it type with myself in to see where I ranked? So I have done it once to see yeah. where I ranked. <laughs> yeah, generally. So, so for my demographic, me personally, I, I think I, I'm like 0 0.02 percent of men. I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying, like, if you look at my height, the fact that I'm not overweight, no kids, not married, mm -hmm. uh, and what my income is, I go in. If you compare to all men, I'm in the pot top 0.02 percent of men. Same thing with Rollo, right? And then we looked at all the women in the group, and we've had several women, and the numbers are usually somewhere between 11 and 9 percent for when we describe the women that are there. But some of them have kids. These are women that don't have kids, not obese. And then because as men, we don't really care what a woman's income is. And so it ends up being, so you have 0.02% of me and I have 9% of you. If we do the fraction, you come to the realization there's a lot more of you than me. And then that's where the scarcity issue comes from. Now, I'm not going to use me as specifically an example because I'm in a relationship. But for a lot of women, what will happen is they'll go out there and then they'll have sex one time with Tristan Thompson. They'll have sex with Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio. They'll they go to Tyga and the... <laughs> They'll go, yeah, they'll go do a, a rap video with Tyga one time, and then they'll think that's their standard. So let's just say we'll give Tyga 95 points of, of status. What will happen is every man from that standpoint has to be a 95 or higher. Even though Tyga had sex with her and then just didn't call her the next day, from her standpoint, she's now re her baseline for dopamine is now 95 or higher. And so when she meets Alex, the accountant, who works really wet hard, he makes about 170 a year, which puts him in the top 10% of wage earners in the country. When she meets him and she sees he's not six feet tall, he's 5'11 and a half, and he only makes $170,000 a year, he is, she attributes like 70 points of status to him, where it was 95 for Tyga. She's like, no, sorry, Alex, uh, I'll date you a couple of times, but I'm still going to go fuck the guy with the 95 status behind your back. And then what will happen is they don't understand that these small number of men that they're choosing from, number one, they can get them to have sex with you. Number two, it's very unlikely you're going to get them to commit. And number three, it's extremely unlikely you're going to get them to commit and be faithful. And and so that's what the female and male delusional calculator is, is concerned with. Again, men have their choice. High status men have their choice of women because high status men, are they're rare. There are fewer of them, just like there's fewer Lamar Jacksons, which is why Lamar Jackson gets 50 million a year, which is the reason why Steph Curry gets 50 million a year, which is the reason why Pat Mahomes gets 50 million a year because of that, right? It's the reason why what did Messi, did his new contract is like 100 million a year, something like that. Lionel Messi, some insane number like that. I can't remember what it was. But when you see, when you understand these concepts, then you you come to the realization it is in the in regardless of like let's say you're the hardcore socialist. When it comes to the sexual marketplace, it still is capitalism. It still is supply and demand. No matter what you think, it's always going to be in supply and demand. And when you don't think it is supply and demand, and we put you and we pair you up with someone you don't find physically attractive, you're gonna be like, I don't want this. Yeah, of course you don't want this. Everybody wants the best looking versions of them. I'm, I'm I'm older. I used to say everybody wants Brad and Angelina. 
right? Because that was the hottest couple, right? Yeah, Brad Pitt that. and Angelina Jolie, right? Everybody wants Brad and Angelina. Every girl wants to date a guy who's hot as Brad Pitt. Every guy wanted to hook up with a girl who's as hot as Angelina Jolie. But like, you know, the thing is, it was it was not realistic in order to do that. And the reason why we had those unrealistic beliefs is because of social media. In most part, it was because of social media. Social media gave us at least physical stimulus or like visual stimulus to people that were not attainable for us. And so that's what kind of threw everything out of whack. Kind of seems like on that note with saying social media, like we form these parasocial relationships. A lot of people look at these celebrity stars and they think they can be them. And I think there's like this skewed perception that average, the term average has been emotionally charged. Now no one wants to be it anymore because all it really means statistically is if I took a random distribution, you're going to fall right here in the middle. Yeah. And people yeah. now think it means bad. So, so annoyed with the term of nor like a normal distribution. Yeah. I'm inside of one Sigma. <laughs> like, well, you're a loser. No, most people are inside of one. 68.27% of people are actually inside of one Sigma, inside of one standard deviation. So plus, plus or minus one Sigma. So, I mean, it, you're, you're exactly right. And the thing is, I, what I notice is when we confront women, usually very attractive women, with this concept of, um, hey, this is the number of men you have to pick from, and this is the number of women that are just like you, they're, they go into this delusional state where like, no, there's still a chance. No, that's fine. I'm a Sagittarius, so I'm still going to find him. He's going to be a Libra. Uh, they'll still go into these like delusional calculations in their mind and they won't they'll anything, anything they'll say, but there's one thing they won't do, Nicholas, they will not lower their standards. And this is a debate that I had uh, where I disagreed with Richard Reeves on this. Richard Reeves believes that women are just going to have to lower their standards. And I'm like, Richard, I don't agree. I think they'll go their entire life and not lower their standards for any reason whatsoever. Like nothing will, they would rather just die broke. They would die alone and childless than date a guy who's 5'11". That's where women are right now. And that's one of the issues. Not all women, obviously. Not all women. Of course. And, and certainly always. there are, yeah, certainly there are there are studies that show that like as women get older, they start to find different things more attractive. So for instance, one of my closest friends is CJ Sparks, the model. CJ's 38 years old. She's open about leaving 38. And uh, and CJ, one of the things she talks about is like now she really doesn't care about a man's height. He could be five foot two, but as long as he takes care of her, like as long as she feels protected financially then she has no issue. She says, I won't date a guy who doesn't make less than who makes less than $5 million. And like, the thing is, while that is delusional, and I tell CJ all the time, she, she's one of my closest friends. I'm like, CJ, you do understand what you're saying is borderline delusional. And she goes, yes, I'm aware. Do you see the thing? But like, the thing is, but she is aware. She's not stupid. Mm -hmm. you, she had a conversation for an hour with Kevin Samuels. Kevin Samuels said, you're in pretty prison. And she is like, for the majority of her life, like, uh, you know, CJ has been more attractive than average. And what will happen is, she'll have access sexually to the highest status men. And she'll have access relationship-wise to maybe a rung below that. But the problem is those men also have access to other women that look like her. And then next thing you know, while you're playing this game of tug of war, where, oh, he's super hot, but I can't get him to settle down. He's not as hot. I can get him to settle down, but I'm not attracted to them. While you're playing this game of tug of war, next thing you know, and I'm not talking about CJ here specifically, but a woman in general now has a 30, 40, 50 body count. And now she's 35, 36, 37 years old. And now she expects to make, get that 10 out of 10 man when she has kids with other people. And she's probably, and not, not in all cases, but in some cases is a new phenomenon. She was having sex, boy, girl sex on camera for her OnlyFans. Oh, she broke yeah. up with that guy. Now she has a new boyfriend and her new boyfriend has to contend with the fact that she's selling porn of her with her ex-boyfriend on OnlyFans. This is becoming an epidemic. This one thing I'm talking about, Nicholas, I know lots of women who are going through this right now. And I'm like, this is a problem. It, it you know is. what I'm saying? This is one of the issues. And then these women are like, like, end up coming, you know, we should just call it, Nicholas, we just should call it the Mia Khalifa effect. The thing that's happening to Mia like Khalifa that. That, Mia, that, that Mia Khalifa can't see. Mia Khalifa, clearly, when she got out of porn, she believed that the word world would absolve her of everything she did while she was in porn, and she believes that she was not responsible for her actions, according to her, okay? Now, what happened is her fans are going to be like, we love you, Mia Khalifa, yay! And that re that representation for her fans made her feel like, okay, good, my fans have absolved me of my... Same thing with Lana Rhodes. You saw Lana Rhodes did that whole NFT mm -hmm. thing, scammed a bunch of people and ran off, because her fans are always saying, yes, Lana, we love you, yes, yes, yes. She's not getting what her her beliefs about reality are not indicative of the real world. She's just listening to her fans. OK, and what happened with Lana Rhodes and what happened with Mia Khalifa is that they started dating men and getting into serious relationships with men. Having the past that they have, meaning having, 
you know, dozens to hundreds of sexual partners filming pornography. Now they come and they're starting to date these guys and they're taking them seriously. And then all of a sudden the relationship ends for one reason or another. He cheated, she cheated, he wanted out, she wanted out, whatever. And then afterwards, they do nothing but complain about men because the equation that they didn't understand was she was dating the man of her dreams and he was dating his favorite porn star. And they didn't, she didn't guess, grasp it until the end. And then so now they just sit there and complain about men. It could not possibly be that these men are holding you accountable to your past. That couldn't possibly be it. And if they are holding you accountable to the past, how horrible is that? Because I'm not accountable for my past. And the other thing with Mia Khalifa is she, you know, the whole thing where she said specifically that that older men dating younger women are somehow missing something inside. I'm like, yeah, they're missing oh, yeah. younger women. That's why they're dating them. Um, but the, the thing is, what, when that whole thing happened, that's what we call talking your book. A great example of that is Elon Musk with Tesla. Elon Musk is like, Tesla, great. And then Tesla's talk, stock buy, price goes up. That's called talking your book. Mm. Tesla might be great, but we know that Elon Musk is biased towards Tesla, right? When, we, when Mia Khalifa says we shouldn't all be dating younger women, she might be right, but why is Mia Khalifa actually saying that? Because Mia Khalifa is not a younger woman anymore. That's the actual reason. So she's talking her book. And now men who are now not choosing her anymore for the fact that she's gotten older and from the fact that she used to do pornography, those men are now lesser status. They're troglodytes. They're weirdos. These men uh, have mental disorders or whatever pejorative she can throw at them instead of coming to the realization, which is as far as the sexual marketplace is concerned, Mia Khalifa is still a very attractive woman, but Mia, and, and she also makes a lot of money. But but as far as the sexual marketplace is concerned, she's lower status now because she's gotten older and because of her past. And there's no way to, to like kind of fix that. Does that make sense? Like yeah, I, th- I love Jordan Belfort, but I also know Jordan Belfort did a bunch of cocaine and had sex with a bunch of prostitutes. Like that doesn't le- like we don't you don't forget that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You know, they're doing another fire festival with Billy McFarlane. They're doing another one. He goes, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to pay back all the people that we robbed the first time. No, he's a sociopath. Obviously he's going to just rip off more people. That's essentially what's going to happen. But we, but like nobody really pays for it, but we, we still know the guy's a crook, you know? So, I mean, I, I just think, I think that's essentially what's going on. The Mia Khalifa effect is what happens is as time goes on and you, your priorities change, you start blaming people for not believing your priorities. So for instance, Again, a woman who becomes older thinks that attractive men should start dating older women. That's the Mia Khalifa effect. Hmm. Yeah, it's like going to the past, like usually they're like sex workers is nothing new. That's been around since the beginning of time, but it's like there was sure. consequences when you did that line of work. You got shunned, yeah. you got ostracized, yeah. you had a reputation. Now I think there's this new narrative of, I don't use empowerment. I don't know, maybe that's the word they use, but it's like it's empowering to own that sexuality when it's like, as a man, we don't really like going back to like the evolutionary psychology. That was not our, that's not what we use to attract other women yes. is our sexuality. Like, obviously we can yeah. have it is more so, like you said, competency, but with them, it was their sexuality. And now they're just putting it out there for four ninety nine a month. Yeah. But, you can become a millionaire but, few and far between, but is that really going to be but, the but, ideal strategy? Well, I want, I want to make one caveat. If Lana Rhodes and Mia Khalifa were legitimately trafficked, they didn't say they were trafficked, but they feel like they were manipulated into doing what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Then I, then that is a legitimate gripe, and I totally understand why they have that concern. And nobody should be trafficked, and nobody should be abused. I agree with that. The problem is that she didn't change her name when her, her podcast, the Lana Smith. She kept her porn name. When Mia Khalifa is on social media, it's not Mia Smith. It's Mia Khalifa. That's not, I don't think that's a real name, but that she's still, again, she's saying I should not be held accountable for the fact that I did porn, but porn made me famous. And I'm going to keep that name that grew when I was doing porn. And I, and I still shouldn't be held accountable, even though I'm keeping the name and the fame that I got from doing that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. For, for someone like me, who's like a, you know, neutral third party observer, I don't hate Mia Khalifa. I hope for nothing but the best. But for me as a third party observer, it, she lacks credibility with me when she keeps the same name, literally has a platform to speak on because of the porn she did, and then sits there and complains about it. In addition to currently having an OnlyFans, where she goes back to sexualizing herself. I find it, the, it it's strange credulity just a bit when I'm supposed to believe that she's not accountable for her actions, and then she's still doing this. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Just then use that money you got from doing porn. Um, 
there's, I, I can't remember what the girl's name is. The girl who used to, the porn star, August Taylor, she's now a famous uh, fitness model. And no. the, hardly anyone can, can like, it, she's lost so much weight, you can't even tell it's the same girl, right? But it is. The, the porn star, August Taylor, if you look it up right now, she's, I forgot what her name is, Monica something, I can't remember. I met her the other day. And she looks totally different. But she still has the, um, the uh, what's it called? The tattoo of the barbed wire on her arm. So it's uh. it's definitely the same girl. And I noticed that like she is trying to get away from her her favorite her previous porn persona, whereas Mia Khalifa and Lana Rhodes are embracing it and yet still telling us that they're not accountable for their behavior. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. By the way, I'm I'm sure they do take some accountability. The problem is the rest of the world doesn't need to change for them. Exactly. Yes. And 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 no offense to them, but they're psychologists and psychiatrists and people who spend their entire life working on this. And those people are going to come up with a solution for us, not those two. No offense. I don't mean to be offensive here, but like Mia Khalifa is not going to come up with the solution to the problem that she is partially responsible for. Most likely, what most likely the, the solution is going to become come with some psychiatrist or psychologist or sociologist who could be male or female, by the way. Uh, and that and that could happen. I would have had so much more respect for the two of them if they had just said, I did porn, it was a mistake. I look back on it and I, I kind of wish that I had done it, but I have to take responsibility for what I did. But you know what it did? It gave me a platform in order for me to speak and it allows me to speak to more people to warn them about the pitfalls of doing porn. 100%, 100%, all in favor of that. That's not what they did though. I did porn, I was, I was used and porn should be illegal now and men who like young hot women should be thrown in jail. That's what we got instead. Well, going on that note, because I know you do the mentoring, the man of action, yeah. what is your stance? I'm not saying do you think it's good or bad, but we now know porn, how it affects the brain. You talk about dopamine yeah. responses. Oh, my God. How it yeah. reshapes Andrew how Huberman, we interact. Yeah, yeah he yeah. talks about it a lot. So what's your take? Like when you work with your uh, clientele or your mentorees, do you talk about this type of stuff? Because it can definitely be inhibiting for a man yeah. trying to make his mark on the world. Yeah, it really is interesting. Like um, there are there's because I was talking to Richard Reeves about this. There are studies that show that like. A, a moderate level of porn isn't horrible for people. It actually, you know, guys stuck in the Middle East for six months on a deployment, them watching some porn is not going to like destroy in the world. But an addiction that causes you to not go to the gym. I've just, certainly, I mean, I was in, I was in the military for a long time. You guys can guess, right? I was was stuck in like austere locations like Altus, Oklahoma. If you guys think that, you know, high testosterone men are not going to watch porn, of course they're going to watch porn, right? The problem is I went to the gym or the solution is I went to the gym every day. The solution was I still got upgraded to Mission Navigator during that period of time in my life. What happens is the problem is, is, is what you're doing just a, a, a distraction or is it a coping mechanism? That's where the differentiation becomes, right? Um, uh, you know, having a young, extremely healthy, active girlfriend, I don't really have a need to watch pornography at all now. Um, but there was times in my life where I did. And the thing is, did I still at the same time make myself fit enough and competent enough to where a young, attractive woman would still want to be with me. Those are the questions that you have to ask yourself as far as do you have a porn problem? That's the thing. A porn's not going to be made illegal. Sorry, guys, sorry to be the one to tell you that it's not going to be, it's never going to go away. So and it's not going to become less ubiquitous either. It's always going to be free and accessible to men all the time. So that's not the solution. The solution is not to make porn illegal. That's not going to happen. OnlyFans is not going to be made illegal. That's only going to get bigger. Okay. You know what we like in the US? Freedom and money. And you know what OnlyFans is? It's freedom and money. They're going to, that only, you know what we don't like in the US? Accountability. We don't, we certainly don't like accountability. We don't pay our yeah. debt. You know what I'm saying? We just take over whatever Bailouts. country we want. You know what I'm saying? We don't, we don't, accountability? No, that's not part of the US code. Freedom and money? Yes. That's why, that's why we do the things that we, that's why we gamble. That's why we have sports, you know, super violent sports like football and MMA. That's the reason why, you know, we have porn and OnlyFans. We don't really want to be held to find all that in actions. Vegas, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Everything we don't, you we just named. Gambling. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we, we're not a super accountable. Uh, accountability is not a huge part of this nation's ethos. So, um, you know, so, so because of that, like those things aren't going to go away. Don't think that they're going to go away. The pendulum is also not going to swing back to the left. The, the, the Overton window on any time period, you're going to see it's, it's swinging to the left. Nicholas, think about the most politically conservative person you know right now, and then compare that to a politically conservative person in 1945. What do you think? 1945, if I go up on this House and the Senate, and like, you know what? You know what I think as a Republican? I support the idea of gay marriage. Oh, yeah. Enough Nobody was doing that back then. But most, most Republicans today are, they, they don't have a huge problem with gay marriage. 
You know what I'm saying? It's like the idea of, of making gay marriage illegal. Now, you may want to change the constitutional protections on it. I know that's what Clarence Thomas is trying to do now. But the idea that, that gay people should just be like thrown in prison like they do in fucking Iran, no sane person fucking believes that. That's crazy, right? So that's that's the issue. Like we've changed. Marijuana is another great example. Uh, you know, we've, we've changed. The Overton window consistently shifts to the left. Think about, dude, my dad spanked me with a paddle. I grew up in Texas in the 1980s. Do you know how controversial that was getting spanked by a paddle in Texas in the 1980s? This controversial. Yeah. Everyone spanked their children in the 1980s with a paddle. That's what you did. And I thank my dad every day. He's not with us anymore, but I'm very appreciative of my dad for giving me that discipline. You do that now, you go under the jail. You know what I'm saying? For trying to discipline your kids. So the Overton window consistently shifts to the left over time. And we as men, or, or just any individuals who are rational thinkers, I don't want to just say conservatives, but men who are just rational thinkers, moderates, liberals, or conservatives, what do we do to, to adapt to this new society? Because a lot of things are better. We don't have the same amount of teenage pregnancy, crime is down, we don't have the same amount of drunk driving or underage drinking and driving, nowhere near the same amount, amount of violence. No matter what you guys think, police brutality compared to like the 40s, 50s, and 60s is way down compared to those, those time periods. Uh, and you know we have all these these issues that we had before. We don't have as many issues. The world is a better place right now than it was 100 years ago. I don't care what anybody says. When you when you look at all those things, you know what is the the trade off is in order to do that you have you're trying to create a more egalitarian society, and in doing so, you don't. It's not the strongest survive. There's advantages to a society where everything is strongest survive. You have monopolies and people who are better at business and people who are bigger and stronger. When you create a more egalitarian society, it's not as strong a society. It's not as durable a society. And so there's this trade off. And we as rational thinkers, we have to consider what do we do during this trade off? Do we give up? Do we try to fight so badly that we storm the Capitol? What do we do? You know, that's the question you have to ask. For me, I think the best idea is to educate. And I think we need to stick within the realm of science when we educate, science and statistics in order to educate. A lot of people are becoming science deniers. I had a, um, a numerologist on my podcast, on my show on Wednesday, and he's just a he's just science denier. In, in any way, shape, or form, anything science says is secondary to whatever he feels. And so... Uh, yeah, it's scary. It, you know, that that's kind of where we are. And and we've gotten into that whole mess too with science denial, where we now we can't have rational conversations because you don't you and I aren't even speaking the same language when you don't believe in things like gravity or et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but like these are oh. debates that I have all the time. And so we as we as rational thinkers, that's what men of action is. By the way, it's it's a it's a course about rationality in science. Um when when we as rational thinkers, we have to think about how do we exist now in this new paradigm. It's not going to be that bad. I really don't like Nicholas. I know this is going to sound really con uh, controversial to a lot of people who are politically conservative who might be watching this. If a trans person, um, there's another one of my rescues. Sorry. If a trans person becomes president, I'm I'm still going to have a successful business. Yeah. Like one second. I'm not, I'm not going to say that I'm now victimized because someone of a different political affiliation or someone of a, you remember Biden got elected, the economy is going to go to the shitter. I'm like, I wouldn't have elected Biden, but I don't think the economy is going to go to the shitter just because Biden got elected. I just like, if, if these things happen, it's not, oh, someone who got elected who isn't a Christian, the world's going to, nah, it's it, okay. I get it. He doesn't have the same morals as I do, but it's not really that big of a deal. That's just the way I see it. You know, I'm still going to be sick. Well, my, my point is, it's not that I'm for or against it. It's that no matter what crazy stuff happens with the elites, it's not going to change the fact that I have enough determination to become successful no matter what. Do you understand what I'm saying? Michael Jordan did not become a killer on the basketball court because, Don, because Ronald Reagan was president or because Bill Clinton was president. He didn't care who president was. He said, I'm going to work harder and I'm going to become so incredibly potent at my job, I'm going to make $35 million a year playing basketball, another 50 million a year. You know, I think Michael Jordan makes over a hundred million a year still from Nike every year. Right. Wow. So, I mean, just crazy numbers like that. He chose to do those things regardless of whether or not the world was going to hell in a handbasket. Do you individually make the decision to be successful no matter what, which is why I think numerology and astrology are so dangerous because it takes the accountability away from you. It's like, if you read the book, extreme ownership by Jocko Willick and, and uh, Leif Babin, it's literally the opposite of what that book says. The, the accountability lasts, it's in some higher power 
that that made you born on some day of the month. And that some day of the month is the reason why you're extroverted or you're smart or you're rich, right? Uh, that this higher power, instead of saying, no, the reason why I'm, I'm smart and I'm rich is because I worked at it. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think taking that accountability away is, is something that's very frightening. It's something that's very, um, taking that accountability away from people is something that's very fright frightening because like, that's literally the problem. You know what I'm saying? A lack of accountability is, is probably the, the source of most of our ailments as a country. Uh, you mentioned that that astrology thing. Um, personalized psychology is one of my other expertise. And my last week episode was one of my mentors who is a lead personalized psychologist. And we talked about that a little bit with astrology. And it's more of a how, how familiar are you with like personality theories? Yeah. So so, so the Myers-Briggs Young thing has been debunked, but it's fun to talk about. And talk, I remember talking going about that. Yeah. So I went uh, I went to UT Austin. I remember the first week of business school, us doing the Myers-Briggs Young and now thinking like, you literally were making us do this thing that had no bearing in reality. There is a bearing between introverted, extroverted, but other than that, like no, thinking or perceiving or feeling or whatever that nonsense was, none of that was true. And it was so crazy how we just like, the, 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 the part of the reason why Nicholas, and I'm sure you may be frustrated with this in your field of psychology, is there's so many psychological theories that could be tested, but aren't. And in evolutionary psychology, in evolutionary psychology, in that specific field, all those theories, if they can test them, they do. Because I think I believe that in, in psychology, the one of the reasons it's a soft science is because they don't want to disprove their own hypothesis. But in evolutionary psychology, there's no politics in that. And so they do want to disprove their own hypothesis. That's why Dr. Buss has gone from a dual mating hypothesis to a mate switching hypothesis. He's changed his belief on that. And that's one of the things he covers in his new book, uh, When Men Behave Badly. So when new information came into the system, Dr. David Buss, who is a scientist, changed his opinion. That's how we as rational thinkers have to be that way. We cannot attach ourselves. Dude, if, if astrology and numerology turns out to be real, then I will accept them as real. The problem is there have been hundreds of studies that show unequivocally they are not real. Yeah. And so because of that, that's why I don't believe that they're real. Whenever new information is brought into the system, then I, I keep continually find out that they're not real. And the counter to that is always use some sort of Barnum effect where it's like, you're a smart person who like takes advantage of opportunities. Your friends trust you. You're generally uh, intelligent, but not too smart. And but like these just generalistic horoscope readings that these people do. Uh, what's his face? Try to do it with me. Um, uh, Gary Grinsberg, he he tried to say that uh, that I, I lost a lot of money in 2019. I made more money in 2019 than any other year. <laughs> and then uh, and then he tried to say that I'm uh, jealous and vindictive. Jealous. I, I literally take my girlfriend to photo shoots so that other photographers can shoot her because she's stunning. And I, I'm I'm not ashamed of the fact that my girlfriend is one of the hottest women in the entire world. So that's why I want people to see. It. That's not jealousy. I'm not vindictive. I've had people like physically attack me online, all kinds of stuff. I won't even say their names out loud. But he got it completely wrong and wouldn't accept that he got it wrong. So he started saying that I was a liar. It was crazy. Like, it's just one of these situations. Because No, your cold reading doesn't work for someone who understands the Barnum effect. That's the reason why it wasn't going to work on me. Um, yeah, I mean, sorry, we're getting off into a bunch of different topics. But you, you before, with the original thing is like, you, psychology is, is a science. As scientists, and all of us are scientists, even if we don't have PhDs, we can all be scientists. The way you're a scientist is by performing the scientific method. And the way you perform the scientific method is by having a hypothesis and then trying to disprove your own hypothesis. Yep. Anyone with an ego, nothing is more difficult than trying to disprove your own hypothesis. That's what makes it so incredibly hard. <laughs> If you go to the scientific community in some sort of journal, by the way, I have allergies and I just sneeze right there. They said, because I scratched my nose, that was a sign that I was lying. They were sure that that was like, it was so crazy. The astrology people, the numerology people, it was crazy. Um, but yeah, no, just going back to the same thing. We as scientists, yeah, being we scientists have to, we, yeah, we, we, we have critical. to, we, we have to be critical of our own, because here's the thing. If you were to take some sort of theory and publish it in some sort of scientific journal, and you had not tried to disprove your hypothesis, you will get laughed. You'll get laughed out of the building and you will lose tenure. You need, but again, when you present, have you ever read The, the Martian by Andy Weir? You ever, ever read that book? Familiar, no. One of the best books ever. There's a movie uh, that came out starring uh, Matt Damon called The Martian, okay, which is I about the book. Written by, okay, I didn't know it was written by Andy Weir. 
So in the book, the reason why the book is so stupendous, probably one of the best fic pieces of fiction ever written, is because every month, Andy Weir would write a chapter, and then he would put the chapter out on a, a bulletin board for physicists, astronomers, and engineers to read and to correct him on the science. And so by the end of the book, he had changed so much, but the science and the math was, was spot on. So the book got incredible reviews from the scientific community due to its accuracy. Now, there were a couple of things that weren't accurate. Obviously, you can't have dust storms on the surface of Mars because there's barely any atmosphere. But there was a couple, for the most part, it was, they, they tried to keep it scientifically accurate. And in doing so, once he took that book to market, it was perfected because he tried to, because the astronomers, the engineers, and the scientists that he had read the book tried to disprove or give him critical feedback so that he could improve on his hypothesis, which was his book. That's how the scientific method works. When we consistently, again, I, or, uh, Albert Einstein, he comes up with the, the idea for general and special relativity. And in order to prove it, they have to observe a lunar or solar eclipse and then see that there was gravitational lensing about where the um, the stars around the sun were. And they made, he made a prediction about where those stars should be. It turns out that was accurate, and which proved the theory of relativity to be accurate. Uh, had it not, then that would have been an example of disproving relativity. The second is the bending of space-time. If you look at the orbit of Mercury, it actually processes at a very fast rate or a faster rate than the other planets because of the fact that the space-time around the sun is bent at 30 million miles away from, or one one third, one 0.3 AU away from the sun. So those things prove relativity. And then finally, the last thing that proves relativity is the fact like you and I are talking probably over satellite communication. Those satellites have to be actually Time travels slower on the surface of the Earth than it does in space because we're in a gravity well here. We're, we're experiencing 9.81 meters per second squared of gravitational acceleration. And so time travels a slightly like a microsecond slower for us. And so the clocks have to be, they have to account for that difference. And that's the reason why GPS works. The original GPS satellites were way inaccurate because they didn't take into account relativity. So we know relativity is real. Why? Because we consistently showed evidence for it and we continually try to disprove it and we couldn't disprove it. Does that make sense? That's yeah. how we come up with the scientific theories and scientific understanding, not from some Reddit board and it, certainly not from Q, not from QAnon. That's not how we get these, these understandings. Make sense? Yeah, Sorry, I agree I with all offended. of that. I just offended. I just offended a bunch of people, lost a bunch of your audience. Nah, this is open space for me. I'm big on yeah, whatever side you are. If it, like you said, rational thinking, I'm big on that. And yeah, just to co-sign thinking. what you just said for the psychology field, that's part of the reason I got out of the clinical realm because yeah. you mentioned male or female dominated. I was like the only guy there. Also, <laughs> yeah. the things they were talking about were more on the Freudian that that still was being talked about, and this was 2015. Unbelievable, so unbelievable. Still Freud being talked great about. man, great thinker completely incorrect psychologist. Can we just call Freud a great thinker, but not try yeah. to call him a scientist? He just wasn't a scientist. He was just he had first. some really interesting that's, thoughts. That's he, what helped a lot. He, he was first to market. Exactly. He was first to market with a, the idea of, of clinical psychology. But the idea that we keep holding Freud up to the standard, it's just so silly. Like, Nicholas, the five love languages. You want to know? I was talking about this. Oh, before. no, uh, no, no. This is, I, I this, is the, this is this is the this is the you want to people are like militarily, no country can stand up to the United States because US is the only one. We have 11 aircraft carrier groups. We have mm -hmm. thousands, I think maybe not thousands, but maybe close to a thousand stealth aircraft, maybe more than I'd have to go look at if you look at all the F probably 20, F 20 200 things. times more than the next closest country more than yeah, like. exactly. That's exactly <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, no, we're selling we're selling a hundred F 35s to the, U, the UK, I believe. So they're, oh. they're gonna have some stealth aircraft. We have uh, air refueling capability. We own the GPS space. We own the the uh, night vision space. We we like we uh, the U.S. military owns the night. From a military standpoint, no country is going to be able to stand up to the United States of America. We spend more on defense than all the other countries in the world combined. So, what is the actual attack on America? The actual attack on America is the five love languages. The actual attack on America is trauma release. The actual attack on America is Deepak Chopra and Joe Dispenza saying that uh, what they're doing is quantum physics. Pop right? psychology. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the actual attack on America. That's actually where America is losing. Um, you know, I, I have respect for them as speakers, but unfortunately, Deepak Chopra does not understand what quantum mechanics is, and he's misusing that term because it's a fun term to use. If you guys want to understand what I'm talking about, look up uh, Dr. Dave's Dr. Dave teaches science. He has one where he talks about mysticism. He debunks mysticism and he goes into exactly, this is what quantum mechanics is. And these are people misusing this term in order to try to sell books. So 
that's the actual attack on America is to make America uneducated. And that's what we, uh, if you want to talk about a PSYOP that's done really a really great job, that's the one that's done the best job. It's allowed for things to flourish like flat earth. The flat earth theory comes because of a lack of an educated populace. And so that's where these things uh, 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 exist, right? That's where these things come from. And it just the, the numerous conspiracy theories. Once you don't have a basis in science to grasp onto, you can just believe anything. And now everything is possible. And then what happens is you don't have any evidence behind your belief about the reptiles that live under Antarctica or the nanobots that are in the vaccines or the fact that we didn't land on the moon or the fact there is no moon and that the earth is flat. You don't have any basis to prove those things. But And now here's the next step, Nicholas. Now you become radicalized into that belief. And now anyone who believes that, that we landed on the moon is an idiot and should be stopped, maybe even physically injured because of their belief that they have. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. ivermectin apparently i mean you you have a basic understanding of medical physiology you understand when somebody gets a have you ever seen the guy who gets the flu and orders the z-pack you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying it's like no the z-pack is uh antibiotic you have a virus a virus yeah yeah but you <laughs> Two but different like, types of but effects. nicholas 98 percent of the population doesn't understand what you just said the difference between a virus and a bacteria they don't even know that a virus is part of the yeah. human and that a bacteria has its own set of completely set of its own dna right so when the president comes out and says ivermectin is going to cure a virus, and you're like, wait a second, that's an antiparasitic. Why would that cure a virus? That doesn't make any sense. Now, CNN went way further and like, oh, it's a horse dewormer. No, it's an antiparasitic. It does work in human beings to kill parasites. But it didn't make any sense to me how ivermectin was going to, was going to cure a virus. And sure enough, once the studies were done two or three years later, we found that ivermectin does not cure COVID at all, has no effect. But when you said that, on some YouTube channel, people bashed you because you were hiding the conspiracy. You were hiding the conspiracy that the medical community didn't want to know. No, the thing is, here's the real conspiracy. Why weren't you educated on the difference between an antiviral, an antibiotic, and an antiparasitic? Why don't you know the difference? Why? It's crazy. How come you know your zodiac sign, but you don't know the four fundamental forces in physics? Why is it that you're sure you know what your love language is, right? but you have no idea how natural selection works. Why is that okay? Does that make sense? Nicholas, think you know evolution is like Pokemon. Like they Correct. evolve they, they, from they think, this to that. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, other, the other part is, I, you know, I did this, uh, I, I really like you to watch the episode we did last night where we asked the, these girls these different sociological questions and the, most of them got it wrong. People, uh, when you ask Americans, 36% of America is Hispanic, 41% is black and like 40% is is white. Like, of course, those numbers don't add up to 100. It makes no sense whatsoever. They think 20% of America is Jewish and another 20% is Muslim. Like, it's crazy. And of course, the wow. answer are it's 12% black, 17% Hispanic, mm -hmm. and about 59% white. 1% of the population is Muslim, right? And 3% of the pop or 2% of the population is Jewish. They don't get that, though. They think that because of what they see on TV, they think that the answers are something different, but they don't understand basic sociology. They, they, they believe what they want to believe instead of what the actual truth is. And when the truth does not fit with their narrative, they become more radicalized. That's called not being rational. What One of the main tenets of my program, Men of Action, is to become more rational, not less rational. My girlfriend has a problem with it too, because whenever there's a problem, like she gets histrionic about the problem, and then Michael solves the problem. How come you never have any emotion? No, I have emotion just like you do. <laughs> Your emotions, though, at is at a 10, and mine's at an eight. But the way I express them, this is the example I like to use. Um, the, 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 the concept of love, loving your family and loving your country, those men who stormed Normandy and, uh, I keep forget, I always forget the year if it was 43 or 44, I forget 44, 44. those mm -hmm. men who stormed the beaches of Normandy, did they love their country? What do you think? They got mowed down by those machine gun turrets. Do you think they love their country? Let's say most half, maybe or but, but were I, there I, because I, of draft. I, I no, uh, in 44 was their draft. I'm not to join to go to that. I'm not sure. I think those are the bravest men who ever lived. Definitely um, brave. That's definite. I think they love their country and I think they express their love for their family and protecting their family. And the way they expressed it was through action. I think you express love through action. You don't express love through histrionics. A lot of times, if you're in a relationship with someone who's kind of toxic, they're going to express, they're going to expect you to express love through. I'm going to kill my, I'm going to slip my wrist if you don't come back here. That histrionics is how they express love. Whereas people who are very successful and very rational, they express love through actions. 
you had a problem and I fixed the problem. Mm -hmm. That's how they show love. We have kill we have children. I made sure that my children were provided for and that they went to college and that they were safe and healthy. That's how I express love as a father that you express love through action, whereas other people need this display of histrionics in order to, to display love. And that's just not, that's just not rational. Like a peacocking kind of like, yes, just for sure. Have this big exactly fluffy right. tail yeah. that has no actual, I guess that's it has exactly a right. purpose to mate, but it doesn't have a functional purpose to thrive and live and whatnot. And that's exactly know, so, right. Yeah. So I know I don't want to take up too much of your time. So before we wrap this up, I know we talked about so many topics, so I think they got it pretty good. And just to give you some credit, and then you probably even know this already, obviously, you've talked to many psychologists that you know yourself better than a lot of people. I've graduated, I have a master's degree in this. I've done clinical doctoral work and no shot to them, but you've showed way more understanding than a lot of those people. I appreciate I, that. I directly work. And you even taught me stuff. So I'm always open Nicholas, to learning new things. Trust me. Nicholas, have you, have you ever, have you ever talked to a girl who's like, I'm, I'm studying psychology and she's like, oh, I want to get a master's psychology. A uh -huh. girl or a guy. And a you're like, Oh, that's times. crazy. What do you, what do you think about Phineas Gage? And they're like, who's Phineas Gage? <laughs> and I'm like, that's the first, for those of you that's who like want to study is. psychology, that is the literal first person you, you study in psychology is Phineas Gage, yeah. right? The reason why we know, the reason why we know there's no such thing as low vibrational energy or high vibrational energy is because Phineas Gage caught a fucking railroad spike through his nine head, nine foot, came out his head, <laughs> a nine foot railroad spike that went through his head and he lived, he lost an eye. And after it went through his frontal lobe, Phineas Gage went from this pious man who loved his wife and never cursed to this mm -hmm. horrible foul mouthed heathen who kept cheating on his wife and acting crazy. And the difference was the damage to his frontal lobe. We know that emotions lie literally, not figuratively, literally mm -hmm. in neurochemical responses in here, not out here and not because of energies. They exist through psychology and neurology, and there are explanations for our behaviors. These explanations may be a little complicated for you, but it doesn't mean that the answer is quantum physics. The answer is human evolution, evolutionary psychology, sociology, neurology. There's people who spend their whole lives getting PhDs to study these concepts. Don't throw them away and instead listen to Joy Behar and Whoopi Goldberg and Dr. Phil and Oprah Winfrey give you some pop psychology answer to what you want to know. If you guys really want to get into deep study psychology, there's so many books that you can read. Whenever you hear mysticism, energy, physics, woo-woo shit, throw the book away. Throw the book away. When you hear a double blind study done with 60,000 participants, keep that. That's the book you want. That's the book you want, okay? 37 culture study of evolutionary psychology. That's the book you want. Not the one where the, the, the guy, no disrespect, the, the German dude smoking cocaine, talking to a 12 year old boy comes to the realization that all boys wanna fuck their mom. I don't know the science behind that one in Sigmund. I'm not sure about that. Not to just like, I, I, Ty Lopez loves Sigmund Freud. Civilization and his discontents. He happened to be right about a lot of things, but he happened to be right. He didn't do the study. He just happened to be right because he's a really fucking smart guy. So that's the only thing I, I would say to you guys. There's so uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, one of the, probably the most important thinker left on this planet. Him, he gets uh, a lot of flack you, too, though. Yeah, Dawkins, you've all you've all know Harari. I know a lot of conservatives hate you. All know Harari. Harari, David Buss, probably three of the greatest thinkers on the planet. When it comes to what they believe, when what they understand, one of the issues is, and this is something, um, the guy who um, did the original Cosmos, what's his name? Um, oh, uh, before Neil, uh, Neil deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Tyson, um, yeah. No, 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 but before, no, before him. Oh, before the guy him? Who, the, ori oh, the original okay. Cosmos, I forgot what his name is. The guy who wrote the movie Contact. Anyway, one of the things he said that was so great, and I, I do remember the quote, was that like, you're sitting there trying to find this woo-woo spiritual explanation for how the universe works the real reason the universe works is way more interesting. Like, like super massive black holes, dark energy and dark matter, cosmic microwave background radiation. The fact that the moon actually has the same carbon-based dating as the earth, meaning the moon used to be part of the earth until there was a massive collision. The four, the moons of, of fucking, the four major moons of Jupiter, the largest one being bigger than the planet Mercury, the fact that there's a there's a fucking Pentagon on one of the poles of uh, Saturn and nobody knows why it's there. There's so much incredible stuff that you can learn from like looking at the periodic table or the way that nuclear fusion works in a star to create all the elements. The world we actually live in is so much more interesting than fiction. So why don't you learn that first? 
and then start believing in astrology, then look at numerology and astrology later. And the thing that you're going to find is once you understand concepts like central limit theorem from statistics, you start understanding natural selection, when you start understanding concepts like gravity and inertia and the three laws of motion, uh, the laws of motion uh, from Isaac Newton and Principia, when you start understanding these concepts, then all of a sudden numerology and astrology doesn't seem so interesting anymore. Because you actually can, you have a testable model for the 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 truth that predicts things like that predicts things like uh, 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 eclipses that it predicts things like you know planetary motion that it predicts things like uh, tides you can you can do that 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 real world of how natural selection works is way more interesting I think it is it's way more interesting and you're so so far more likely to get fooled it's one last one that really bugs me well I don't know where COVID came from I think I I'm pretty sure judging by the genome it looks like it did come from a bat. Now, was it released from a lab nefariously in Wuhan? It could have been. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't think it was, but maybe it was. I don't know. These conspiracy theories. What I do know is that it wasn't made in a lab. Do you understand how people don't understand biology? Nicholas, there are people out there that think that I put chemical A and mix it in with chemical B and I stirred it around and then I used lasers and cre I made a virus. There is some evolutionary ancestor to COVID-19 that existed billions of years ago. COVID-19 is just the is just the descendant of whatever that is. All living forms, all living creatures and viruses, viruses aren't technically living, but all things that replicate that like that like that in biology, they have some descendant that goes back billions of years, even we do, right? Humans and bananas have 50% the same DNA. When you go back and you and you look at that, then you understand viruses aren't made in a lab. Could it have been some nefarious thing? I don't know, but it, it definitely was incubated in some other form of mammal. Now we just had this discussion. Uh, a lot of people who are in the science community be like, "Yeah, that sounds rational." People who are not in the scientific community would literally want you canceled for even me saying what I just said. You know, how could you be so naive? Clearly, it was Anthony Fauci who like made he made the virus. And then the virus was there for population control. 50 million people died. You know, like more than that die every year naturally. I'm not saying it wasn't a terrible thing. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. 60 million people, um, six, no, it was more than that. It was, no, it wasn't 50 million people. I can't remember how many people died total or whatever. But like more people died from the Spanish flu. It was way more pervasive than this. Mm -hmm. And the bubonic plague, like something like 30, 40, 50% of the human population died yep. from that. So when you come to when you you come to that realization and you see like having these discussions, we have a populace that legitimately believes Nicholas. They legitimately believe that there were scientists who made a virus. Do you understand that? Like to have a conversation with somebody about this. No, there was a virus and it may have been manipulated, but it wasn't made in a in a in a uh, lab. Does that make sense? It, yeah. it, it, again, I'm not saying it was Anthony Fauci may have be guilty of all this shit. I, I have no idea. What I do know is that the people who are making these arguments don't have basic understandings of biology. And so they make these arguments anyway. By the way, they found other strains of COVID in bats that live in Indonesia and India recently. Uh, so the, the idea that it did come from a bat is starting to have more and more credibility. It, again, it's circumstantial, but it's like it doesn't prove anything, but it does look like the idea that it did come from another form of mammal. Do you know how many people don't even realize a bat is a mammal and a human is a Like they don't even yeah. know that. They don't even yeah. understand that, dude. They don't even understand that concept. That yes, the reason why is because they have red blood cells and they have uh, uh, they control their own body temperature and they have live births and they have hair just like we do because they're mammals just like we're mammals. They don't get that, so most people don't understand that concept. So they're like, well, how do we get it from a bat? Bats don't look like humans, man. So that's that's essentially what happened. I'm not trying to you know dunk on anti vaxxers or whatever like that. I'm just like, before you start believing in woo woo stuff, take a second and investigate like actual biology, actual physics, actual medicine then make a decision. And what you're going to find is that the real world that we live in is way more interesting than the woo woo beliefs that you have that the, the, uh, the fed, the fed chairman in the CIA killed John F. Kennedy. No, there's a fucking lunatic Marine who defected to Russia and came and put kill Kennedy. That's probably what happened. You know what I'm saying? That, that yeah, just razor, the thing. simplest yeah, the solution it, is usually it, that. Correct. The one that the one that requires the least number of, of assumptions, but here's the other thing, man, even if Lyndon Johnson uh, oh, you know, what a time traveler went back in time and killed Kennedy, whatever can, new conspiracies out this week. Is that the excuse for why you live in your mom's basement? Is nope. that the excuse for why you're fat? Is that the excuse for why you don't read? Is that the excuse for why your business doesn't work? Because the Illuminati, the Rothschilds are out there to stop you. If that's the case, 
how, why is it so many people can become rich? And I'll tell you why. Like Andrew Tate, actually, of all the things he said, I actually talked to him yesterday. If Andrew Tate, of all the things he said, the one thing that I do appreciate it is like, yes, there is a matrix. Yes, they don't want you to be successful. And yes, I am successful because I figured out what the matrix wants. I like that attitude better. The attitude is if everything is out to get me, I'm still going to be successful. That's the proper attitude you should take along with the rationality and understanding basic, understanding basic uh, fundamental science. Uh, I agree. All the, I work with some top level athletes. I have a few Grammy award winning people as clients and they all have the same mindset, just like that. There's nothing going to get in the way of what they're doing. We all live in the same uh, society, but it's just a matter of what do you accept? Do I accept the fact that the world sucks? I don't. I said, I'm going to overcome it. And I've lived yeah. it firsthand myself. My dad's a police officer whose father was murdered by the police and he became a police yeah. and done a lot for his community down here. I'm in South Florida, by the way, like the Fort Lauderdale area. So he's done a lot down here. And it's like, I could have been like, oh man, the man's out to get me. Like, nah, if he's out to get me, I'm going to get him first. That's how I look at yeah. it. So, but yeah, so, exactly. um, uh, so yeah, I'm going to let you get out of here because I, I know we got things to do, but you definitely gave me a lot of insight. And I want people to look into your stuff. So plug all your social medias, websites, all that good stuff before we get out. Um, yeah, I, I, I teach, a, I'm a male performance coach. Uh, I have a program. It's called the Men of Action Mentoring Course. Um, there are a few women in the course too. Like we, we let women come on the calls and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, we try to get a very diverse group of people to come on there. But the basic premise is networking is an evolutionary adaptation, meaning like networking in order to get a better job, to meet the woman of your dreams, networking in order to, to build a business, to find new mentors, all that networking is actually the same kind of networking. And we teach you how to do it through evidence-based studies and evidence-based techniques. We have specific pillars on um, entrepreneurship, leadership, evolutionary psychology, critical thinking, social media, high status networking, and, um, and a winning mindset. We also do a little bit on finance. There's 114 modules in the program. There's about 2000 hours of Q and A's in the program right now, we're about 550 students, 550 clients that have gone through the program. It's me and there's several other uh, coaches that um, that also help with the program. And it, it's the the successes that we've been able to show in the program have been just so monumental that it's it's really changed a lot of people's lives. Now, I will tell you this about the program, just for, for those of you who are not familiar. If you go to MOAMentoring.com, don't do it at work. It's not safe for work. There are a lot of insanely attractive women in my marketing. Because to me, that is one of the ways, not, not the only way, but it's a way to show higher sexual selection and higher status. So I use it as more of like irrefutable visual evidence that what we do works. Uh, you're going to see a lot of beautiful women. None of them were paid to be in any of the advertisements. None were paid to be in any of the things that we do. We basically teach you like how to use networking as an evolutionary adaptation through science in order to get a better, to, to, to have a better lifestyle and to network with higher status people. And we teach you how to show up to a party with 70 girls. Hey, there it is. Yep. So, yeah. Specifically, step by step, how to show up to a party with 70 girls. I'm not exaggerating. I'm being completely serious about that. All right. So and also, you know, social media is under Michael Sartain. Yeah, everything, everything is Michael Sartain except for TikTok. It's Michael Sartain podcast. But yeah, you can find me on uh, YouTube, all those different places. And then MOAMentoring.com is where you can find the program. Yeah, I'll put that up on the screen for the ones watching on YouTube. So, guys, thanks for tuning in. Like I said before, this was great. I hope you guys learned a lot. I definitely did. So, as I always say, thanks for tuning in and get your mind right.